ABC 10 News at 7 starts now. It felt like a big moment. Um, it felt like I got to be, have a little small piece of something that felt pretty historic. A sense of relief and excitement from one of the first local nurses to receive the COVID-19 vaccine as San Diego County records its highest daily death toll from the pandemic yet. Good evening, I'm Steve Atkinson. Kimberly Hunt has the night off. Here are our latest numbers. 32 new deaths were reported today. That brings our total to just under 1,200. And more than 1,800 new cases were reported, bringing that total to more than 111,000. The numbers come just hours after Naval Medical Center San Diego and Rady Children's Hospital began to give the first doses of that vaccine. As ABC's Mimi Alcala explains, it's a big moment for the county. It was exciting. As hospitals across the county start receiving boxes of Pfizer's highly anticipated COVID-19 vaccine, Naval Medical Center San Diego was the first to vaccinate its frontline health care workers. It kind of feels like it has this um, energy of perhaps the beginning of the final chapter of what has felt like a very long year for all of us. Lieutenant Junior Grade Catherine Sinoit is a staff nurse working in the emergency department at the Naval Medical Center, and she was the first there to roll up her sleeve and get that shot. Band-aid on, actually, yeah. But it feels like I have an obligation to do everything I can to ensure that I'm immune so I don't pass on anything to my patient. Like many, Sinoit was a little skeptical about a vaccine that was put out so quickly, but after doing much research, she says she was reassured. Companies that have developed this vaccine have put a lot of work into ensuring and sharing the data to show people how hard that they work to make sure that this was rolled out safely. After the injection, she says she was told to look out for any adverse reactions similar to other vaccines. I'm going to get the first dose. A couple of hours later, Rady Children's Hospital also started vaccinating some of the most at risk personnel at the hospital. I think this is a really important step for us to get back to some type of normalcy. Um, we've seen lots of businesses and people and families be affected by um, this virus. And I think it's really important for us, especially as healthcare workers, to um, you know, take a stand and be you know, the first people to get the vaccine. At this point, the vaccine is not mandatory for staff at either hospitals. Those who do get it will continue wearing masks, and 28 days later, they'll receive a second dose. This is going to be a long process to roll out, so we still need to be really careful about wearing our masks, social distancing, and following all the guidelines by the CDC. Mimi Alcala, ABC 10 News. Other local hospitals say they do plan to start giving out the vaccines to their workers this week as well. Poway Unified is recommending returning all students to distance learning. Now this will take effect when classes resume after the winter break on January 4th, and we're told that it will last through January the 15th. It still needs board approval. The district says it's been experiencing staffing shortages since Thanksgiving. It says it's seen an increasing number of staff who have had to quarantine upon positive test results or close contact. It also stresses there have been no evidence of any COVID outbreaks on any of its school campuses. The school board will vote on those recommendations Thursday night. Teachers in the San Diego Union High School District are unhappy about its plan to welcome students back to campus after the new year. And many parents gathered before tonight's school board meeting because they think the plan doesn't go far enough. Our ABC tennis reporter Rachel Bianco shows us why the reaction is mixed. It's the typical first day of school picture for Ethan and Aiden LaRoque in a year that has been anything but routine. It's just been such a terrible travesty for these kids. Lori LaRoque is among the parents pushing for five day a week in-person learning starting in January for the San Diego Union High School District. Her twins are in eighth grade at Pacific Trails Middle School. She saw the difference when one was back on campus, even in a modified version. It was such an interesting litmus test. When her son, who was at home, went back to campus, she says the difference was immediate. He just went from being sort of despondent and frustrated frustrated at home and his spirits lifted and he stood taller. He was excited to put his backpack on and actually step on campus. But the California Teachers Association sent the district a cease and desist letter saying it is not safe for teachers to return to class while the county is in the purple tier. We have two weeks of winter break where we know families will be traveling extensively and it just doesn't make sense to come back immediately after 
you know, those holidays. The district says it will continue working towards the goal of providing a one day a week in-person option beginning January 4th. More than 1,600 people have signed this petition saying the district's safety plan for reopening doesn't go far enough. The district has maintained that if they are able to teach virtually, then they're able to come in uh, and teach within the classroom in front of students. If the district requires teachers back on campus, union leaders estimate 10 percent, or roughly 60 teachers, won't return. Rachel Bianco, ABC 10 News. And at tonight's board meeting, a newly elected trustee plans to ask the board to bring students back on campus full time by the end of January. We'll let you know if there's a, a decision tonight. New data from school districts shows that English learners are among those falling behind the most during distance learning. Our partners at KPBS spoke to teachers who explained how hard the online learning environment is for these students. One teacher at the Grossmont Union High School District called it an almost impossible situation. Imagine myself going to another country and having to do what they're being asked to do in Arabic or having to do that in Mandarin. I would fail miserably, you know, but that's what we're, they're being asked to do. Educators do point out that this represents another example of how the pandemic has amplified existing inequalities. In California, English learners are more likely to come from low income families and experience homelessness and are less likely to graduate than their peers. And there is a new effort to help California students bridge the learning gap caused by the pandemic. State Assemblywoman Lorena Gonzalez announced a new bill to make that happen. It would provide the state with a roadmap that includes more opportunities for summer classes and course credit recovery, streamlining a student's ability to repeat a grade if necessary and provide special consideration for grades earned during the pandemic. More than 6 million Californians have now signed up so far to get the phone alerts if they may have been exposed to the virus. Last week, we told you when the state launched the new CA Notify system. UC San Diego helped develop that app. Once a person with COVID enters their information into the system, an alert is then sent to people who have come in close contact with that person. Officials say the more people who sign up, the more useful that system will be to help get exposed people quickly into quarantine. And you can follow any new developments surrounding the pandemic by downloading our free mobile app. Just go to the App Store and search 10 News. An update now to a story that we have been following out of El Cajon. A police officer remains in critical condition tonight after being dragged by an SUV during a traffic stop yesterday. Our ABC 10 News reporter Leah Pizzetti has more about the suspect who police are still searching for tonight. Monday morning, an El Cajon police officer stopped to check on a parked rental car blocking traffic along Washington Avenue. The man driving the car put it in gear, so the officer tried to stop him. Then the officer was dragged down the road and hit by another moving car. The driver and a woman inside got away. The officer is now in critical condition, and El Cajon police have identified 41-year-old David Pangalinen as a suspect who is a native to Guam. Troy Torres is a journalist in Guam who has been covering the news, and he knows the suspect. His picture was there, and I recognized him right away. He's a uh a schoolmate of mine back in uh, elementary and middle school. Torres says the suspect's name is one known across the small island of Guam. Mr. Pangolinan's uh, family is very well known. Uh, a, a very nice family that has uh, built up businesses over the years and has contributed a lot to the community. So, you know, his name does stand out. So he says they're all wondering where this suspect might be as police continue to search. A police officer in Guam who I spoke with today said they wouldn't know if the suspect tried to go back to Guam. He said everybody who lands on the island has to go to a mandatory quarantine facility for six days. Then as they leave that facility, every single person is documented so they would know if he tried to leave and they're all on high alert looking for him. As for El Cajon police, they continue to ask for the public's help in finding this suspect. Leah Pizzetti. ABC 10 News. As Leah just mentioned, anyone with information on the whereabouts of this suspect is asked to call El Cajon Police. The numbers you can see is there at the bottom of your screen. Prosecutors must decide whether to try a teenager as an adult after he was arrested in connection with the murder of a Carlsbad woman. That teenager was arrested three weeks after 68 year old Lori Torberg was found stabbed to death along Hosgrove hiking trail. He was booked into juvenile hall on murder charges, but prosecutors may choose to try him as an adult. The more dangerous that person is, the more likely 
they are to be charged as an adult. One defense attorney says if prosecutors do charge the 17 year old as an adult, the judge will do then have the final say. A detention hearing has been set for Thursday. California regulators just hit Uber with the $59 million fine for refusing to hand over data regarding sexual assault on its app. They also threatened to revoke its license to operate in the state. This comes a year after Uber revealed that roughly 6,000 cases of sexual assault occurred between 2017 and 18. A judge says Uber has 30 days now to hand over the data, though it can file an appeal. The company insists sharing data could compromise the identity of assault survivors.